Who spoke those words, let there be light, and there was. And in that same breath, the stars fell in love with one voice, creation. You do all things. You do all things well.
everybody. Welcome back to Bible Study. I'm super excited to be with you all. If you don't know me, my name is Elder Janae, and I have the privilege of leading our panel discussion uh, for our Bible study on the book of Romans from letter to life. We're going from the letter of law to life in the spirit, and we're going from the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans to uh, using what he said in our daily lives. And so I'm so glad I'm not alone. I'm joined by our minister Donald, our brother Kevin, and our sister Brianna. Um, and so we are going to jump right into to chapter three. If you've been with us for the past few weeks, we went through an introduction in chapter one, chapter two, and we are now here in chapter three. If you've missed anything, no worries, go back, catch up on those videos. And as you're watching today, we want to make sure that you're engaged. So ask questions, put an amen, put some emojis, uh, make sure that you're engaging with us. And also we want you to share this video with someone who needs to hear what we are teaching about. And so just to give you a little refresher on the book of Romans, the purpose was for Paul to write to a church that he had never been to to teach them the doctrine of Sorientology. We went over that in week one, and that really is the doctrine of salvation. Um, his audience was Jews and Gentiles in Rome, and so some of the key themes that he talks about consistently, which we will talk about consistently, uh, is the universality of sin and freedom, justification by faith in the role of the law, the righteousness of God, unity in the body of Christ, living in the spirit, and practical Christian living. And so I just want to give you a brief recap of chapter two that was taught by Brianna. Uh, Romans two addresses the principle of judgment, the role of the law and conscience, the hypocrisy of religious pride and the necessity of, ge of genuine repentance and obedience to God's commands. It emphasizes that God's judgment is impartial and based on the truth and that true righteousness comes from inward transformation and obedience to God's will. And so if you remember in chapter one, we really set up how, uh, how we talked about how man uh, needed a savior. There was no way we could uphold the law. We talked about man's depravity, the depravity of human nature and so how we needed a God to be able to come in and usher us into the righteousness that comes from uh, life in the spirit through Jesus Christ and so let's jump right in um, and so we're going to start with this first section it's called God's righteousness upheld and so we're going to read Romans 3 verses 1 through 8 I do want to say this is a shorter chapter in content uh, you will notice that because the apostle Paul reiterates uh, some of these key themes over and over again um, that some chapters are shorter than the other, but the content is still there. Um, and so let's uh, start with the first four verses. We're reading one through eight, but let's break it down uh, from verses one to four. It says, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness null nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. And so we just came out of chapter two, and so the Apostle Paul was talking about the Jews and how they felt that circumcision uh, was their entry point through, for righteousness. Um, and the Apostle Paul makes it clear that the advantages of the Jew are not due to their faithfulness, but rather God's faithfulness to them, right? It was not about how faithful they were to God. It was rather about how God was faithful to them. And the Apostle Paul, he knows that there are some people that are going to make the argument, right, um, if their faithfulness nullifies the faithfulness of God. And the truth that he, and the point that he was making was that God was, and he still is faithful, even if the Jews didn't believe. Even if the Jews did not uh, take on the faith that was now being offered to them through uh, faith and not through works, God's faithfulness was still entrusted to them. It was still shown to them, right? Um, and so I'm going to bring the panel in in a minute, but um, I recognize that people are often challenged with God's goodness because of the actions of others in the state of this world, right? It's unfortunate that people question God's goodness because of humanity's badness. Like, it's pretty, like, silly when you think about it. So I want to ask the panel, how can we answer the questions how could God exist if, or how could God be good if we see humanity's rejection of him? What is the answer to people not believing that God is faithful because humanity is so depraved? I'll jump in because I've actually heard this question too many times. Yes. And I, Same. I've heard it and oftentimes I have to refer back to that God gave man the power of choice. Yes. 
And that is always a thing you have to think about. It's he, the, the angels are, are, are designated to worship him and praise him. Man has a choice to choose whether to do God's will or not. We choose to do good or evil towards our brother and our sister. God didn't invent slavery. Man enslaved man. And those are, sometimes I keep it right there. It's that simple. We have the power of choice. So if we choose to do wrong, and then we propagate that wrong as a as a as humanity has. Of course, on the other side, you do have those that push to do that which is right. But the sad thing, and it's that we choose as a sometimes people choose to do wrong, and those wrongs come out as devastating uh, tragedies. I mean, I'll, I'll be practical. World War Two, Adolf Hitler, one of the worst people that you can ever see, and hypocrite on top of that. But we'll leave that. And then. People can choose to fight against evil. Mm -hmm. Evil triumphs if good men do nothing. Yes. Again, it's a choice. Yes. So, okay. um, well, you know, just to go back on what um, Minister Donald just mentioned, you know, it's it's a, also a consequence of understanding that, you know, God's ways are higher than our ways, yes. and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So it's yes. us trying to reason with a sovereign, morally yes. righteous God, yes. a God who has laid the foundations of the earth before man, yes. and we're trying to understand His reasoning, and, and we're trying to make sense of it all. Yes. And in the midst of all of that, He gave us the opportunity to live in paradise with Him. However, man fell, and now we live in the consequence of the sin that man created through yes. through Adam and Eve. And, you know, that's, that's where we're living. We're living in a fallen world. Mm -hmm. God has given us free will. Yes. And unfortunately, there's evil that exists and persists in that. Mm -hmm. And he gives us, and God is so loving that he gives us the opportunity to turn from that. Yes. And I think that is, that's, that's a demonstration of his love. Absolutely. Because a true, a true father is going to give their child the opportunity to make choices. Yes. And he'll also give chances, and that's also part of the forbearance. He holds back his yeah. judgment for, from us yeah. because he also wants to give us the opportunity to make our choices to turn back to him. Yes. The same with the prodigal. He waits on us. The prodigal father, he, the prodigal son's father waits on him until he returns. Yes. And when he does return, he, he, he receives him mm -hmm. with cheerfulness, with joy. He celebrates. Yeah. So the father wants to celebrate our return mm -hmm. into his embrace. However, we have deviated from that. We've deviated from his plan. Yes. And that's, that's, a, that's the consequence of the fall. So yes. I, that, that would be my um, response to those who ask, you know, whether God's love is, is truly love or whether God is a good God. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good. Um, my answer is, is fairly short. They gave amazing answers. Um, but my question, or my answer to the question would probably be a question, right? Um, and it would be, who is God? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, who is God? Because just like um, Brother Kevin stated, if you know who God is, if you know that he sent his son so that we wouldn't perish and have eternal life, that's love. Like, yeah. are you looking at it through your vantage point? Right. Like, are you this? Are you judging God based on man? Because already you have a faulty understanding of who God is and his sovereignty. Yeah. So I would first pose a question like, who is God? Do you have an understanding of who God is himself? Yeah. Because then all of these, um, all the scriptures now make sense. The fact that we need a savior makes sense. The fact that he holds back his wrath, right? Like even wrath is his love essentially, right? Like he wants to um, put us on a right path. He wants us to not live a life of sin so that we would be eternally separated from him. Yeah. So my question is always like, who is God? If we approach him with a pre preconceived notion or an understanding of who we think he is and not what scripture said, who scripture says that he is, then already we're starting, we're starting off shaky. And I think a lot of people, when they ask this question, um, some ask out of genuineness, right? But some people have, don't really understand the nature of God. Yeah. Like we, we quote scriptures like John three seventeen, but do you really understand what that means, right? So I think um, even in Romans um, 2, how Paul held up a mirror, right, um, so that people could really see themselves in the light of the scripture, right? I think it's important for us not to judge other people and then put that on God. Yes. Like put our, our humanity on his sovereignty, right? Like put our flesh on his deity. So I think understanding who God is, that would be my answer to the question. Yeah. That's really good. I want to quote uh, theologian. Sorry, go ahead. Go oh ahead. no, I was I was gonna add something because in the scriptures, and this is so you know, Paul is just amazing because he 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 foreshadows this. He understands our limited thoughts. So he says, "I speak to you in a human in a human sense because I know that your knowledge is limited." 
So even then, he understands that our, our knowledge of God is so limited that he still needs to frame his argument in a way that is 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 comprehensible on us um, on on a le- on a playing field that is that is uh, on is yeah exactly on the level of human understanding rather than God's understanding. Yeah, yeah really good. I want to quote uh, theologian Charles Spurgeon when he says about these verses. He says, "I have to say with Paul, what if some did not believe?" It is no new thing, for there have always been some who have rejected the revelation of God. What then? You and I had better go on believing and testing for ourselves and proving the faithfulness of God and living upon Christ our Lord, even though we see another set of doubters and another and another. The gospel is no failure, as many of us know. And so what he is saying is people are always going to reject this idea of God because of humanity. But it's the job of the Christian to keep living and to keep proving his faithfulness in such a way that it makes sense for other people. And it won't click for everybody, but we get the privilege of living our lives and believing God in such a way that we make the faithfulness of God of effect. Right. Um, And so. He goes on, he, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul quotes Psalm 51 and 4 to further solidify his point. It says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. And so, again, we have this idea of not being held to man's standard but being held to God's standard, right? Um, and that we are not subject to what human thinks, humanity thinks about God or thinks about his judgment, but we are subject to the judgment of God. God. And so we're going to go a little bit further. We're going to uh, read the rest of those verses, verses five through eight. And it says, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way, by no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. So the Apostle Paul, he says a mouthful here. And uh, we're going to get into that. But I want to bring the panel in uh, because he mentions this word at the end, condemnation. Um, So I just want to um, get a definition. How would you define the word condemnation? So, okay, I'll I'll just, I'll take a, mm, I'll jump out there. Um, So... Whenever I hear the word condemnation, I automatically think punishment. But not only punishment, just what's tacked onto it, right? So it's it's a form of connection that is connected to guilt and shame, mm-hmm. right? So as the body, like, we are called to correct one another. We are called, you know, even God, he chastises those whom he loves. But with conviction, right, which is a word also um, used commonly, mm-hmm. there's, like, love, right? So he'll correct you in a loving nature. Yeah. However, the enemy, right, is really good at condemning us. So say I make a mistake, right? What's tacked onto that is guilt. So now someone, let's say, give an example, right? Someone corrected me, um, and it, it might have been in love, right? Because sometimes we can self-condemn ourselves as well even when it wasn't the intent so I think with condemnation um with that correction now I pull away now I shy back now I can't work in the church anymore now I can't um all because that guilt and that shame is kind of like tacked onto us which we know is not God's intent at all yeah that's really good and I think I think you that's one of the examples when we talk about from letter to life how you brought the practical how you brought the here and now definition of condemnation um and in this sense you mentioned uh two words that that are in the official definition of condemnation um and it's the judicial act of declaring one guilty and dooming him to punishment and so even when you talk about this idea of what the enemy does to us now is in the middle of our story he is pronouncing punishment and guilt on us, right? When we know that we've already been justified and we don't have to deal with condemnation. Um, But this condemnation that Paul is talking about is he's talking about just condemnation that comes at the end of guilt, right? And so in these verses, verses uh, 5 through 8, Romans 3, 5 through 8, Paul is dealing with twisted perspective. Um, God is holy. He's pure. He's good. And he would not use the sin of people, the sin of people that he loves, as an opportunity to bring himself glory alone. And so the apostle 
Apostle Paul is teaching to the fact that people would say, oh, so God is using our frailties. He's using our sin just so that he would look good or he would look better. Right. Um, I want to quote and I want to say this. We the reason why we're including quotes from teachers within our church is because I saw this post on Instagram one time. It was a, a preacher and she was saying she wants people to get familiar with the people among her as being seen as theologians. And so the reason why we quoted Minister Richard in the last um, teaching and the reason why I'm going to quote Minister Kelly now um, is because I want us to look at the people among us as theologians. We don't got to wait till we in the grave to call somebody a theologian, right? And they don't have to look a certain way, if you know what I mean, uh, to be considered a theologian. And so Minister Kelly Thompson said this about these verses, God has nothing to prove and loophole faith hurts us more than it glorifies God. I'm going to say that again. God has nothing to prove. And loophole faith hurts us more than it glorifies God. God would never put us in a position to set us up to sin that he might be glorified. He does not need to prove himself in that way. He's already proven that he's the big God from the beginning. And so he does not need human frailties to point to his goodness and how good he is. Loophole faith would be a tragedy for us. And in his goodness and his sovereignty, he has not subject us to that, right? But he is using, really, and this is where we get that scripture, all things work together. He's using our frailties, right, to show us that he loves us through them. But it's not to prove the point that he is God, right? Um, the truth is, it would be unjust for God to use humanity these frailties just to get glory that would be a twisted and a terrible God to serve and he does not do that and I want to read two scriptures here the first one is from Deuteronomy 32 and 4 it says the rock his work is perfect for all his ways are justice a God of faithfulness and out with and without iniquity just and upright is he and because God is just because he's upright he's not using our sin to get the glory Isaiah 30 and 18 says, therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. God wants to show us mercy. Our need for him will always exist, whether we acknowledge it or not, and his goodness will always exist. If we became perfect tomorrow and we never sinned again, he would still be a God that's deserving of glory. He does not use our sinful and need our sinful humanity to get the glory out of our lives. Anybody have anything about that before we go on? I saw you was getting excited. <laughs> yeah. No, so, uh, like, this just, I don't know, this is exciting me. Um, one a scripture that came to my mind is... Um, I forgot where it is, but it says that justice um, and righteousness are the foundation of his throne, right? And I love how Paul, like, if you need a tip for apologetics, like, this is how we defend the gospel. Like, we defend the gospel with the gospel because yes. he's dealing with all these um, twisted perspectives and the way that people could could turn um, the intent of Scripture and what Jesus has came to do and all the things, how they can turn it and flip it um, for, for man's motives or for any other reason. So I just yeah. thought about apologetics and how a lot of people um, want to be able to defend the gospel or even when questions come that try to threaten God's character yeah. just using the scriptures to do that like using the letter using what um, theologians using what Paul um, and, and the epistles bring us to literally live this life out because not only are we living it out but we're also defending and speaking about what we believe so just hearing you use those supportive scriptures I'm like even in the Bible like the Bible defends it defends itself God defends himself right so yes. that's just what I thought about and God that's really good. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking of couple of verses like there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are yes. in Christ Jesus yes. and I'm like you know what the word condemn and you read the definition the dooming piece of it mm -hmm. the dooming like it's all over yes. and God that's not God yes. he wants us to be reconciled back to him Absolutely. and that's why you no know, you can't live in condemnation yeah. you can't we we not you we yes. cannot live there it'll yes. stop our progress and it gets back to something we said uh, last week in the lesson about transforming and renewing of our mind, yeah. you talked about the perspective. What's our perspective now? Yes. How do we? How are we learning our our salvation? Our our, our, our savior. Yeah. How do we, so. yeah. 
That's really good. Um, and so Paul, he goes on to support this point again, and he uses a lot of, a very large chunk, verses 9 through 18, really is Old Testament scripture to back his argument um, and talk about how nobody is righteous and how this um, idea of nobody being righteous is still is not the basis of God's glory, right? And so we're going to uh, read through those. And so it says, what then? Are we Jews? Are we any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that at all both Jews and Greeks are under sin as it is written no one is righteous no not one no one understands no one seeks for God all have turned aside together they have become worthless no one does good not even one their throat is an open grave they use their tongue to deceive the venom of, venom of asps is under their lips their mouth is full of curses and bitterness their feet are swift to shed blood in their path are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known and there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And so the Apostle Paul, again, is supporting this idea that we've started really in chapter one, that no one is righteous. Um, and there is this need for us to be saved uh, through faith and not through the works of the law, right? And so he's going back to his argument with the Jews that no one is righteous. Innately, no human is righteous. We were born in sin. We were shaped in iniquity. And there is no way, no matter what you do, there is no way for any one person to be born righteously without sin, right? We will all eventually, the Bible talks about uh, man's days, it's like few. And in the trouble, comes right for a, a few days that you're gonna start to work in your unrighteousness right um it's about <laughs> you got a few weeks before you start getting unrighteous right and so um nobody is justified in his sight without the work of jesus right um and so i just love how the apostle paul again like you said uses scripture to defend scripture right he is not just and this is a man who knows the scriptures right backwards and forwards right um he uses what he knows to be able to uh teach and preach this argument um, of nobody being righteous, right? And so we're going to move on. And so that's one of the reasons why this chapter is so short is that reference uh, scripture there to the Old Testament. And so we're going to go to verses 21 to 31, and we're going to break these um, sections down. Um, and this section is called the righteousness of God through faith. Um, and so in this uh, section, Paul begins to speak of the righteousness of God under the new covenant, the newness of God's work in Jesus. Previously explaining God's righteousness in relation to sin and the law, Paul now ties in the righteousness of God through faith by grace separate from the law. This passage explains how justification by faith in Jesus Christ is available to all, regardless of their ethnic or religious background. It emphasizes a universal need for salvation, the basis of justification through Christ's sacrifice, the exclusion of boasting, the inclusion of Gentiles in God's plan, and the relationship between faith and the law. And so I'm going to read verses 21 to 22. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, there is no distinction. And so Paul begins by declaring that from apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Previously, the only way to see the righteousness of God was through the law. There was no other way to know God's standard and know what he expected and know what was required of us except by the law. But now he is saying his righteousness has been made evident because of Jesus Christ and all who believe. And so this righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe regardless of their background. And so I want to bring the panel in uh, because there is this word that's used here in verse 21 and that is uh, the word manifest. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. And so I want to know uh, what is this type of manifestation that Paul is talking about and how does it differ from how we see it used today? What is this type of manifestation that Paul is talking about and how do we see it used today and how is it different? Um, so I'll go. Um, I believe that the word manifest here in its context is pointing to Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
And it's, it's stating that the righteousness of God's made manifest in Christ Jesus. And that's essentially what I believe through this scripture um, Paul is, is attesting to. And as we see it in, in a modern context, ma- I think modern, like, I mean, manifesting is, is more um, attributed to um, new age Mm-hmm. ideologies and things of that nature and yeah. I believe that it's, it's, it's veered from its original intent and now people have used that word and perverted it to, to mean yes. something completely different. Yes, yeah, yeah. The definition here for, for manifest, the way that the Apostle Paul is using is really simple. He is saying that, well, the definition is plain, open, clearly visible, right? Obvious. And so he's, when he uses the word manifest here, he is saying that the righteousness of God has been made clear, Apart from the law, right? And so when we hear people talking about manifesting, the reason why I include this is because I get this question often. What's the difference between what I'm trying to do and what the Bible is talking about? They just see it's the same word and they think it's the same thing. Um, But the manifestation that is being practiced today is like conjuring something up, right? Believing that you can will something to happen. You can create something. When Jesus has already created the way that needs to be created, what Jesus came to do was reveal the way that has been made, right? And so when he talks about manifestation, it's the revealing of the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. And that's important to know. One of the reasons why we said that we want to do this book is so that people could clearly articulate what they believe. And so the next time somebody asks you what manifestation is and how it differs from what they believe and what the word says, you can tell them that this manifestation is a clear revealing of the person of Jesus Christ, of God through the person of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. You know what? Go, uh, yeah. A- as you're saying that, and you said revealing, mm-hmm. At, because it's already there. Yes. You just can't see it. Yes. Which means, and we talk about that the, 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 in this age, the minds of people are blinded mm-hmm. from God, from the, 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 man, the, the trueness and the uh, true mm-hmm. salvation. Our job is to re- help to reveal and manifest yes. God, Christ yes. the right way. Yes, absolutely. The right way. But, you know, drop the scales from your eyes. There's so many verses mm-hmm. that do refer to that. But in this age that, yeah, it has to be revealed because it's hidden. Yes. Sin is hidden it. Mm-hmm. hypocrisy may have hidden it, mm-hmm. different things in society may have yes. hidden who Christ really is. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. yeah, just, yeah. just a thought. Yeah, no, that's really good. That's really good. Um, and so we're going to go to the next verses, verses 23 and verses 24. Um, and here Paul tackles a universal need for salvation, right? Previously he said that it was available to anybody uh, regardless of ethnic or religious background, right? And so he's going into the universal need for salvation. And verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so I, the panel thought they were going to rest, but um, I have a, a question uh, specifically about verse 23. Um, how have you, you, have, have you heard this scripture used most commonly? What is the actual meaning here in relation to Paul's message, right? And that's verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How have you heard that used most commonly? What's the actual meaning here in uh, Paul's message? Actual meaning or how it's been used. I'll go. I'll go know how it's used. Yes, how about go that? that one. Go that Usually one. Usually, when I heard it, you know, all have sinned and, and come short of glory. God usually it refers back to the Adamic sin. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and, and you referred to it before that we were in paradise, and you know what? You you, you disobeyed the word of God, and now we're all kicked out of paradise, and we all are. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry. I mean, I, I, <laughs> we all gotta pay. I mean. It, it, yeah, but that's the original sin. So the original Adamic sin is now, now we are, are saved through the, the second Adam. Sometimes the people refer to Jesus as the second Adam. Yes. Now we are saved through him. Yes. But that's usually how I've heard yes. that referred to. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Have? I've, I've seen it referred to as, in a sense, like a license to sin. Yes. And that's, and that's how I've seen it. Like, oh, yes. oh, you, you. You did that. That's okay. You know, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Just get back up and do it again tomorrow. You'll be all right. <laughs> um, but I. But then, as I was, as you were speaking, I thought of First um, John uh, chapter one, verse eight to ten, and it uh-huh. says, "If we have, if we say we have no sin, we yes. deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us." Mm-hmm. So you know, the first part of it is that you know the people who say those things, they're obviously making an excuse. Yes. 
You know, it's an excuse to continue to sin. And then the latter part of it is that, you know, with this scripture is saying that we all have, yes. we all have sin in us, yes. but because we have sin in us, we need God's grace. Yes. And we can't just abuse his grace because yeah. by abusing his grace is to say that we don't believe that God is a, grace, a gracious God. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a turning away from him and it's, in a, it's a suppression of his, his righteousness yes. and it's an acceptance of unrighteousness. Yes. So good. I, that's um, Minister Donald. You know, I was I was really I was excited for you because I never heard it used like that before. Most people, when I hear it, it's like, uh, like you said, like a license to sin or and like a feel good, right? Like we all sin, right? We we all for short, um, which is true, right? But the original intent for this scripture is that Paul is making salvation equitable and useful for every person, right? So but we, we talked about it before these verses. He said that everybody has a need, regardless of your background, your religious background, your ethnic background, everybody has a need for Jesus. And he's saying that is because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? So this is not just about um, your license to keep sinning because you have sinned, right? Yeah. This is about the fact that salvation is a need for everyone, right? Because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Hey, no, no. I, I ain't never heard that one. But, I, but you know what? I'm aware now. Yeah. I'm aware. We, we prepared. We prepared. There you go, right? And so um, here, Paul reiterates that all have sinned, right? Um, but the point is that they are justified by God's grace, grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so even similar to uh, Kevin's point, this idea that, um, you know, if we say that we don't have sin, we are a liar, right? Everybody has sin. And so we have the beautiful opportunity to be justified and we have been justified um but as a gift of redemption that is in christ jesus sorry um even um to another point right like connecting it to chapter two i think that this um can serve a point where it says all all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god even speaking to those who believe that their works right like i'm morally upright so they may not understand their need for a savior because i do all of the I follow the routine or I follow, you know, become very real ritualistic without understanding it. So I think that this could also speak to them that we are all in need. Yes. Right. We all for short. It doesn't matter yes. um, where you're like we mentioned, ethnic background mm -hmm. or your status in, you know, wherever it is that you live. Like we are still all in need yes. of the salvation. Right. Because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody essentially is perfect. Um, Jesus is the on only divine being that is perfect. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And so uh, that was a universal need for salvation. And so we go from that salvation. Um, and then Paul starts to talk about the basis of justification. He mentions it a little bit um, in verse 24. So I'll read that just to connect uh, verses 25 to 26. So verse 24 finishes. Uh, We're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. My Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so I want to define this word. He uses um, this word pro propitiation. Um, and again, a reminder, we want to be able to bring some of the common terms of Christianity to you so that you have language for it. And so the word propitiation is a removal of God's punishment for sin through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so when Paul talks about everybody needing salvation, he brings up Jesus, right? And he says that God put Jesus forth as the perfect sacrifice uh, by his blood. Um, so that we would receive it by faith. And so that's what that word propitiation means. Um, he also mentions this idea of forbearance, right? In verse 25, he says, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. And that word forbearance is God's deliberate restraint. So Paul explains that God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through his blood, demonstrating God's righteousness. 
This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had overlooked, he had passed over former sins. It also shows God's righteousness at the present time so that he might be just in the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, right? And so when we talk about this idea of wrath and like judgment and condemnation, we cannot forget the fact of the, these two important facts. That number one, Jesus Christ was provided as a propitiation, the substitute, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's the first thing. And number two, God exercised divine forbearance when he could have punished at the time he wanted to punish. When he could have condemned, when he could have made us guilty, he in his divine forbearance, it means literally he held himself back. He held back himself um, so that he would continue to show his righteousness to us, right? Um, this is the goodness of God, right? That we did not get at the time what we deserved, but Jesus Christ stepped in our place. He became the propitiation for our sin, and we experienced the divine forbearance of God. There is no other religion that exists where is the God that does that. No other God and no other religion sends himself and holds back his judgment that we might come into alignment and right standing with him. It's only the blood of Jesus and only this God that would do that kind of work for us. And so the Apostle Paul, he talks about this idea of justification, and then he gets to, right, and this is really important, if you know the Apostle Paul, he don't play about this boasting, um, he excludes boasting, right, verses 27 to 28 says, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded, by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of law. And so Paul emphasizes that boasting is excluded because justification is by faith apart from observing the law. It is through faith in Jesus Christ that both Jews and Gentiles are justified, not by works of the law. And so if you remember in chapter two, we talked about it, right? How the Jews were prideful um, and they felt like they were better than the Gentiles because they upheld the law and they were circumcised and they did, or they were, and Paul even talks about it, right? They were entrusted with the oracles of God first. And so that was a pathway of pride for them. But now now, Paul is saying, never mind all that. Like, forget about all, all that stuff that you all did in the past. It doesn't matter. You cannot boast about this type of righteousness, this type of salvation, because this came from faith. It did not come from your circumcision. It did not come from your Torah. It did not come from you practicing feasts and festivals and all of those things. It only came from the propitiation, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so that's a message for us, right? We're going from letter to life. We who have been saved, it is a point of rejoicing, but not boasting, right? We get to rejoice in the fact that we are saved. We have been saved. We've been engrafted into the family of God, but it's not of our own works. Like the only thing you did is say yes. And even that was because of him, right? How, because the Bible talks about he, call, he uh, called us before we even called onto him, right? And it's his loving kindness that even drew us to him. So we wouldn't have even been able to come if he didn't draw us. Like we wouldn't have a leg to stand on if he had not done all of the work for us, right? Um, and we are even now, like we are being kept kept because of Jesus, right? Like, I don't have no keep a power of my own. Um, he has justified us and he is keeping us until the day of Jesus Christ. Um, I don't have a question, but you have anything on that? You know what? I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you. All I'm feeling is gratefulness. Yes. There's a gratefulness that I, ha I have. Absolutely. If I'm going to boast, I'm boasting that I'm grateful. Yes. Yes. That God has given me salvation. And you're right. He didn't say anything but yes. He didn't work for it. didn't pay for it. You could have mortgaged everything you had, yes. put it all there, and it would be nothing. Yes. But I am grateful that God has given me the gift of salvation. Yes. Absolutely. Love that. Um, and so we're going to uh, conclude these verses here. We're actually coming to the end um, of this lesson. Uh, verses 29 through 31, it says, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Thank you, Jesus, because I'm a Gentile. Since God is one <laughs> who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by his faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. 
And so Paul concludes that God is a God of both Jews and Gentiles. And the reason why I always get excited about that is because if you remember, Brianna defined in chapter two that a Gentile is anybody who's not a Jew. And since I wasn't born a Jew, I'm excited that he is the God of Gentiles also because that is me. Um, and so he is the God of the Jews and the God of the Gentiles. Um, and there's only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, right? So this is important. This is an important distinction here, right? So the Jews are those who are circumcised, right? Um, but if they did it by the law, they would not be justified. If they are circumcised by faith, then they are justified because they are putting their trust in the circumcision, the circumcision of their heart that comes through Jesus Christ. And so when he talks about the uncircumcised through faith, he's now talking to the Gentiles because they did not participate in circumcision. Right. And so he's saying even the people who did not practice the law at that time are justified through the faith that they have in Jesus Christ. And so he is saying, essentially, wherever you find yourself circumcised, uncircumcised, as long as you do it in, through and by faith, you are justified. And I think that's so good, because sometimes even when we think about um, believers now, um, that's how people can come in off the street and they are like saved and they are immediately on a level playing field with us. Whether you've been saved for 50 years or five minutes, we are all justified through the same faith in and of Jesus Christ. And this is a beautiful way that we see even one of the key themes in the book is um, this unity in the body. And that's to help us, right, to not look at somebody else because you haven't been saved for this long or you don't know these scriptures or you don't know to put your finger up when you walk through the church, right? Um, it's a way that we are all made one through the one who has justified it continues to justify us. And so I have um, this, this last verse is really impactful. And that's one of the things I really love about the Apostle Paul. And I know this is one long letter, but whoever divided this book up, they really did their good dividing. Um, it says, right, in verse um, 31, I'll read it again. He says, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? He says, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Um, and so Paul anticipates the objection that his teaching nullifies the law. He already knows that the Jews are going to come at him and say, what are you talking about, right? Um, and so I want to ask this question before I finish that thought. Um, if Jesus fulfilled the law, is there a purpose of the law now? If so, what is it? If Jesus completely fulfilled the law, fulfilled the law is there a purpose of the law now? If so, what is it? So, okay, I'm going to, again. Um, so uh, the Bible says without the law, there, there is no transgression, right? So I believe that the law serves a purpose in just making a straight line a straight line, right? Like before, um, in the Old Testament, the, the purpose of the law was like an agreement, right? So this was the terms of agreement between God and the Israelites. Yes. Now, being that Jesus fulfilled the law, we no longer have to adhere to those terms but it gives us, I don't want to say this wrong, like not an understanding of who God is, but it also creates a, a distinction yes. almost. Yes. Um, I hope I'm done saying this right. But I believe I'm, and that's a purpose. That's what I think the purpose of love. <laughs> yes. That was good, Brianna. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, um, I believe that, you know, the law is, is essentially um, God and um, God making us aware of sin, making us conscious of yes. sin. And Paul speaks about that. Yes. He talks about how we were made conscious of sin through yes. the law. Yes. And he even talks to the Gentiles and he says the Gentiles have the law written on their hearts. Although yes. they didn't know the law, the yes. law is still written on their hearts. Yes. So it's, it's essentially God's desires and his will for us Play, you know, given to us yes. on, you know, on, on paper, essentially. Yeah. Um, however, it also is the precursor to Jesus Christ. Yes. And that's why we can't do away with it yes. because we need it because it is the it is at the core of God's desire and his will for the prophecy of Jesus. Yes. And that's why it is it's, it's essentially like the, the, the stepping stone to yes. the revelation of Jesus Christ, which yes. is the which is the the, the the what is the law of prophet? The, 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 <laughs> I got you. I got you. Just, just, just like, yeah. The, the testimony of Jesus is the oh, is the is the spirit yeah. of prophecy. Yeah. Yes, there we go. So that's essentially um, at the at the root of it is the the spirit of prophecy, which yeah. is Jesus. So that's why um, Apostle Paul is stating that we can't do away without yes. the with the law. We yes. need the law. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Just one sentence. Um, it it, all, it reminds us of our need for a savior. 
also. Um, so when we see just in books that lay out the law, right, we said in chapter two that there are like 613 of them, right? When we realize how we really cannot obtain that, yes. it just over, it makes us overflow with gratefulness for the sacrifice of Jesus. Yeah. I like it all. It's like the laws are guidelines, but yes. guidelines, yeah. but it's, if you told me 613, first I got to memorize, six, I can't memorize 613 laws. I barely got the Ten Commandments down right. So, and I'm thinking about all this and imagine having to live with the pressure yes. of having to live all of these laws. And, yes. and, and, and back then, it's death, you, stoning. And then, but then with the law, there was a, a, condemn, a, con, a, de, a condemnation. There was an ending, a dooming. There's a dooming feel with the law. Yes. But then God says, you know what, even though, like you said, it's written on our hearts, but sometimes you're going to fall short. It's okay. Grace is here. My salvation is here. We can reconcile you back. It's okay. Yeah. Guidelines. But you, yeah. like you said, it's, we're grateful mm-hmm. that, you know what, I fell short. And not, not an occasion to, not mm-hmm. using it for an occasion to sin. Yes. But I'm grateful that though I did commit this sin, I have an advocate with the Father yes. to be reconciled back to him and to live. So I'm grateful. For salvation. Yeah. And also, one of the reasons that the law was there to was to reveal the condition of man's heart, right? Um, we, and somebody talked about, like, guidelines in and, and a way to see um, what really was inside of people, right? Um, and I think about it, like, when, when you drive on the highway, like, you need those lines to show you which lane you're in, right? Without it, everybody's just going to be, like... Just, I, I need this amount of space. You get over there, right? Um, and so the law really gives us also our moral law, right? It tells us um, what is right to do. And, what, and some of those things are like still true today. Like you shouldn't be doing some, yeah, love your neighbor, hello. Don't be doing this with another man's wife. Yeah, don't kill, hello. Um, the law stands for like a moral compass for humanity. And like you said, Kevin, it is written on our hearts. Whether we re- admit it or not, there are just some things you know not to do, right? And that's not just because you're so good. It's because God has, and we talked about this, I think in chapter one, how God has revealed himself to man either by revelation, like actual, like seeing his works or by conscience. That's the word that uh, the apostle Paul uses. And so we are without excuse, right? We know, um, but the law serves, gives even more reason not to give us excuse. Right. Um, and so, and like you said, of course it points to Jesus and what he would be to us. Um, and the fact that we need a savior. Right. And so Paul here, he anticipates that people will say that his teaching nullifies the law, but he asserts that faith does not nullify the law, but rather upholds it. Faith in Jesus Christ fulfills the righteous requirement of the law as Jesus himself fulfilled the law perfectly. And so what the law in the Old Testament was missing was this righteous requirement. It was missing this heart part, right? It was missing our inward man being transformed. But now it's being fulfilled, not just in the work of Jesus Christ, it's being fulfilled because we we now meet the righteous requirement. We now meet the terms and conditions where our heart needs to be changed. And that is because of the work of Jesus. And so We're concluding here. I have one more question for the panel, but um, in conclusion, just a little bit to summarize Romans 3. Romans 3 underscores the universal need for salvation, the sufficiency of faith in Jesus Christ for justification, and the exclusion of boasting in one's own righteousness. It highlights the central message of the gospel that salvation is available to all who believe, regardless of their background or past sins. And so my last question for the panel, and everybody can answer this. For many of us, this concept of justification by grace through faith is not a new concept. Is it useful to review it in passages like these? What can you get from a primary review of the, of the concept of justification through faith? How can it help your walk? Okay. Um, is it useful? Yes. <laughs> Let's just keep it simple. Um, because I need to be reminded of my salvation. I need to be uh, encouraged, um, maybe rebuke, reprove, we go into all those other words, about what I'm living, how am I living it. Yeah. And as you grow in Christ, there are new levels to think about and to deal with. But you always have to make sure, you know what, don't forget your, don't forget your first works, your first love, yeah. and how you started this thing. Yeah. So we don't fall into condemning others because of our self-righteousness. You can become self-righteous living, being in the church, saved a long time. You can fall into those traps. 
So being reminded of why I'm here mm -hmm. and what I'm doing, for me, that's it's absolute necessary. Yeah. necessary. Yeah. Yeah, and as you were speaking, I was thinking about how you can read a scripture right now, and then 20 years from later, there will be a, a completely yes. new revelation that comes from it. So yes. that's why I think there's a consistent refining that needs to be done and a renewing of our minds every single time. So we're, but yeah, it's a refreshing, essentially. We're refreshing ourselves. So as we review this and as we go over um, the concepts and the themes that um, Apostle Paul speaks about, um, there is a, um, a, a refreshing that is happening. Yes. And in that process, there's going to be new revelations revelation that comes with it and our faith increases in the process because now there's context yes. and there's whole yes. new context that we're getting from yes. it the way we must we might have read it five years ago yes. we're now getting a, a completely different context coming from what we're reading now yes. Yes. yeah so for many of us the con the concept of justification by faith is not new um what can we get from a primary review uh, what can we get from a review of passages like this how does it help our walk so I, I think not only just this, but just all of scripture, um, it, it increases our faith, it refreshes us, it helps renew our minds. I think living in a world where there are so many conflicting um, theology, so yeah. much conflicting theology, so many opinions being thrown at us, I think being rooted to um, knowing that we are justified and it is by faith, right? So that we could never, like it's just showing God's love. Going back to the beginning where we talked about the character of God, reading scriptures like this really reminds us that there's nothing that we could do. There's nothing that we will do, right? Yes. Um, that will will make us perfect, morally perfect, morally superior, however you want to look at it, um, to earn this salvation. But it truly is a gift of God's grace. And to think, um, I don't want to undermine the term faith, but like all we had to do was believe. Mm -hmm. Like all we have to believe, not not only believe that he exists, just believe in him. Yeah. So to know um, that Jesus literally put on flesh so that we have the opportunity, right, to see God, right, um, and just live in this grace, live in the grace that, that Jesus brings. I think that it affects our walks. It affects how we speak to one another. It affects how we show up in community. Mm -hmm. um, it affects how we defend what we believe. So I yes. think just staying rooted, um, and Paul does a great job with that, using all of these terms, but staying rooted in what and what he is saying and what Jesus has come to do is a continual refresh, refresher. And I think this is why we should continue to come back to scripture, yeah. um, not just assume that we know, but just reread and remind ourselves um, of the gift of grace that we truly have. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I would say if I can answer that, I would say that this also keeps us from becoming the Jews. Like, I think that we can easily, like, think, like, we have it together or we've been in this for this amount of time. Um, but this passage really humbles us and it reminds us that we all have sinned and we were all justified and had a need um, of being saved. And so I pray, um, even as you all journey through this study with us, that you never become the Jew, uh, but that you always remember that you had need of a Savior, right? And that this is what this book is about, um, that Jesus Christ came to justify us, he came to save us. And because of that, we've got a message of... Um, to tell this dying world, right? Um, we don't look down on them, but we understand we've been there in their position, right? Um, and we get to tell them about this gospel uh, the way that the Apostle Paul affectionately called it my gospel. We get to talk about our gospel and we get to help people along the path of being in right standing with God. And so I pray that you enjoy this message, this teaching, um, and I pray that you will consistently join us every week. Uh, one thing that we said in week one is consistency wins. And so you will be able to have your faith strengthened as you journey along with us. And so uh, we want to bid you a good night and we will see you all next week.